Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and thrilled to tell you about the second edition of the CODIS, now available for $2.99 on Kindle. Get your copy. It's a story, a biblical thriller about the weaponization of DNA. Imagine if Satan got the the DNA of the Levitical line, the priestly line of Aaron, the ones who will gather together to be the high priest, to run the Sanhedrin that's going to call for Jesus' return. What if there was a way to identify that? Well, you, my friend, this last Christmas probably got a 23andMe kit, and you sent your DNA off to a lab so, somewhere, and that DNA went into a database, and that database is now being hacked all over the world. We have a track a listing of all the hacked DNA databases from around the world. Somebody's doing something with it, and if you want to know what they're doing with it and how they're weaponizing it, this is a book for you. Also, my latest book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life, we take you right to the Garden of Eden, right to the base of that tree, and we tell you what God was trying to show us with 49 supernatural laws using 49 things of the natural, from the dirt all the way out to the fruit of the tree. You can get that at ignitingannation.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the book and give us your email address and we'll send you the first chapter. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our newest friend, Dave Carter, who is the author of Anatomy of an Affair, How Affairs, Attractions, and Addictions Develop, and How to Guard Your Marriage against them. Dave, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thanks. Look forward to this. Dave currently serves as pastor responsible for counseling ministries at the First Evangelical Free Church of Fullerton, California. His main task is the oversight, training, and supervision of the extensive lay counseling program of the church. He also serves as pastor of marriage ministries, consultant to various support groups, and gives oversight to caregivers of the mentally ill, Family to Family Training Program. He also serves on the board of Marble Retreat Center in Marble, Colorado. He is married, has four adult children, eight grandchildren, four of whom live in Turkey. And in their spare time, they jog together and have completed the Free Press International Marathon. Dave, you have such a great marriage story of your own. What would lead you in your background to write a book about affairs? <laughs> Everybody wants to really answer that question. Well, the uh, first two of uh, the first three pastors I worked with when I graduated from seminary ran off with other women in the church. And when the second one did that, I decided enough is enough. I'm going to go back to graduate school, get me a psych degree and figure out why pastors do this. So that started in 1977. I went off to Wayne State in Detroit and uh, spent the next five years there and eventually graduated and wore myself out in the process and got licensed and joined a research team and spent 10 years researching risk factors for clergy mal sexual malpractice, pastoral infidelity. You know, that's it's incredibly interesting. I've known several pastors who have fallen. Uh, I was actually falsely accused, but I was smart enough to have installed a video system which recorded all of my movements. So I had video evidence to protect me from the false accusation. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we look at Paul's writings and it says to shun all appearance of wrongdoing, it's very difficult to, um, and I no longer lead a congregation. Uh, we uh, branched off into a media ministry and now reach millions around the world as opposed to thousands on a Sunday or a Friday night in my case. Uh, but what I began to see was there are traps that are being set and laid that the compassionate pastoral hug for a grieving person or that greeting hug or that parting hug uh, and I did uh, many years of counseling, uh, could have been uh, the one button that got pushed of one thought. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's, you can be misinterpreted. You know, your heart can be right, but you're just part of the equation, just one half of the equation, actually. So being on guard is part of protecting yourself and being smart this culture. When uh, you were growing up, 
what part of the country did you grow up in? Midwest, Kansas. Midwest and Kansas. And so yeah. you, you church, church family, church upbringing? Uh, eventually, yeah, uh, in high school uh, especially. And then uh, went off to uh, school in Kansas City and um, then uh, went into a youth ministry. I actually ran uh, waterfronts for Christian camps for several years. Uh, then went into a youth ministry and eventually um, left that and went into a family ministry uh, type program and uh, came out here in California 30 years ago and run kind of a counseling program. The impact to you of seeing infidelity not just from the standpoint of a pastor falling, but the fall out. Mm. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the statistics are of uh, if there has been an affair. Uh, biblically, you can certainly reconcile and forgive, but it is uh, considered to be the death of a marriage as if a spouse had died taking you all the way back to the original text in the Old Testament, in the Torah, which tells us that if the partner is dead, then the surviving spouse is free to remarry. Uh, if you're caught in adultery, then you are to be stoned to death so that the partner is free to remarry. The concept of death of a marriage in this betrayal, uh, also it's now symbolic, we don't stone them to death, but the uh, offender is prohibited, uh, according to the text, from remarrying, but the uh, one who was the victim uh, has now become widowed or become a widower because that person has committed what would be the equivalent of Old Testament death. Yeah. Well, the whole idea of treating adultery is a brand new field. It, the very first book ever published in the English language on adultery treatment or recovery was published in 1990. And it was the very first ever before, you're so right, uh, uh, Pastor, because uh, committing adultery destroyed marriages. You had two choices. You either left the marriage, got divorced, or you swept it under the rug and went on. So this whole idea of having evidence-based treatment for adultery and really being able to identify which marriages can really uh, be salvaged and go on and move on and uh, repair themselves, all that is uh, just getting started. And the research is just beginning to trickle in. So it's, uh, it's interesting. I love it. It's kind of my passion. I never would have chosen it, but I love doing it. Well, there's actually a counselor here in Birmingham that specializes in ministering to pastors. And when I went through this false betray, false accusation, um, there was an actual betrayal uh, perpetrated, and I wound up stepping down. The board decided that it was better that, that, that too much, too much yeah. division better, and so recommended that that my ex go to counseling and that I should go to counseling. And I picked a counselor that specialized in counseling pastors. Oh, uh, God. So he is, is the pastoral minister of the oldest Anglican church here in Birmingham. But every Monday he, pastor, he, he, he counsels pastors. So I went to him because he could understand the role that I was in and I had been placed in, and how do you recover from uh, a betrayal? There's yeah. two, two sides to the betrayal. Absolutely, yep. Uh, and your side is just one of them. <clears throat> That's that, right. So, so it, 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 it was a very, very interesting process that he was, uh, he felt very called to do that. Uh, in your un beginning to understand the dynamics, this, the art and the science of the anatomy of an affair. What were some of your startling revelations? The oh, thing, I, can, the, the I can tell you some of those. Yeah, <laughs> the, things, the things that shocked you the most. Yeah. Well, the first thing coming out of uh, Scripture 
was that being a seminary grad, I just kind of assumed adultery was adultery was adultery, okay? But when I began to really look at what they even, the Bible had to say about it, I began to realize the first four classes of infidelity or of adultery actually occur in the Bible. And so we that first class is a one-night stand. That's a great illustration of David and Bathsheba, no relationship. They had no prior connection as far as we know. That class two, which is a, a drawn out, emotionally charged, uh, long standing possibly relationship, uh, that's a Samson and Delilah thing. We we see his head in her lap, and yet he can't leave her knowing she's trying to kill him. And he stays there until she does, right. so to speak. So then that third uh, situation is um, what we call sexual addiction, and that's Eli and his two sons. And they took women out of the the path to offer sacrifices, took them into tents, had sex with them, turned them loose. God said, you need to stop that practice in Israel. He didn't. God took the lives of those two priests and actually took Eli's life prematurely as well. And then this is the fourth class of uh, uh, sexual uh, compulsivity or sexual infidelity. And that's what we call an add-on affair. So I was speaking to a pastor's conference here in Florida, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, was talking about this. We're just starting to see this in good marriages, and we're not sure quite why it's happened. And no, I did not have an illustration from the Bible. One of the pastors stood up at the back and said, that's Abraham and Hagar, because it's an add-on. It meets a marital void. It's a very narrow relationship. It's not. They're not going to leave their spouses or families. There's no sense of us running off together. It just meets a particular void in the marriage. And so sometimes we see that happening uh, in uh, good marriages, even. But then that fifth class is not in the scriptures because it actually wasn't available to 1995. And that was when the Internet became available to us. And people started going back and getting in touch with old girlfriends, boyfriends, people they've had longstanding relationships with. And those just kind of explode overnight. We basically say 60 days, you'll find ways to sleep with them and meet with them. Because the infatuation's in your head. You don't have to build a relationship. You already have a shared history. You know, that's really, it's really kind of funny because um, I've actually connected uh, with my first date. <laughs> uh, she, I can understand. Yeah, she's, she's remarried, uh, has moved to Ohio, um, head of the Cancer Society because she had a child with cancer. And um, we've kind of through through Facebook, you know, I I she'll show pictures of her and her grandchildren. Um, we haven't spoken. Uh, she's married. I'm not married. Um, but but um, that's a 55 year old uh, friend. I mean, we went to elementary school together. We went to high school together. You know, yeah, yeah. a connection yeah. from the past. Uh, yeah. but, um, no, I, I was, I was never a person of wandering eyes. I, I, I had a lot of congregants that would, would, uh, you know, a pretty girl would pass by and you, you, you can't avoid that. Uh, you're in a mall, a pretty girl walks by. It's what you do after she walks by that really puts you, sure. set, sets you up. And that's the wandering eyes. Yeah. Uh, I guess I would call that the King Solomon syndrome, yeah, which, which yeah. is, uh, you know, there was a TV show that eight is enough for him. A thousand wasn't enough. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Yeah. The, the other thing I'd say, though, it's not just uh, the history uh, of old girlfriends and boyfriends, because uh, unless you were promiscuous, you can remember every person you've ever kissed. So it, it, those memories are planted in the brain. They're embedded in the brain. So the danger of going back, not just to old friends. We're not talking about just old friends. We're talking about girlfriends, people you had romantic feelings for or, or for him. Those kinds of feelings are stored in the brain. And so if you go back to this individual and you get back in touch and you stay in touch over 30 days, you'll begin to feel confused about your marriage because your spouse isn't generating those kind of feelings inside of you. And if you stay in touch another 30 days, that's when you really get into trouble. You, you're just sure you're married to the wrong person. You'll be trying to meet with this person, and you'll end up sleeping with them. We say zero to 60. 
in the field. You know, Dave, the Bible in the Old Testament was very specific. Adultery was the, consum yeah. the consummation of the act itself. Yeah. In the New Testament, Jesus says, if you look upon a woman and think, yeah. Does that fall into the category of what we might call an emotional affair? Well, it can and certainly is involved in emotional affairs. E emotional affairs are what we call, uh, they're emotionally charged friendships. You might never have touched the other person. You might never have kissed, never been erotic with them. But when you see them or you receive a text from them or uh, an email or a tweet or whatever, it changes your mood. That's the first stage of emotional infidelity. It changes your mood. Secondly, you'll begin to be share personal rather than just professional. You'll begin to share what's going on inside of you versus what's going on outside of you. And that's the second threshold when it becomes a more personal, nurturing kind of experience for you. And at that point, the language we use in, in this process is you begin to starve the marriage and you begin to feed the friendship because this person understands you better than your spouse does and maybe is more interested. Then you begin to save it. You hide it. And it becomes kind of a secret stash for you. You can always go back to it. You know what's going to benefit. You know what's going to happen. So when you have a bad day, you get in touch with that friend or you go back and email them and you start building this exchange. I've seen companies fire people when they do three thousand texts a month there's nothing erotic in any of those texts but they know hr people know that somebody is robbing the company of time they're texting while they're driving they're going to have an accident there's going to be lawsuits they don't want people around there doing that kind of stuff because they're not paying attention to what they're doing you know that's that's it's very very interesting that you would bring up uh something that would be i, I wouldn't even think of of how you would be able to identify the symptoms of an affair. Uh, I, I think that that uh, there's a certain amount of blindness that goes on. Oh yeah, that, there is. That that uh, I, I know in my lifetime I've been betrayed many times. I never see it coming because I was always of the mindset that if I could understand crazy or I could understand um, infidelity, or if I could understand thievery, then I was no better than the thief. I was no better than, the, I was more an understanding of the counterfeit than sticking with the authentic. And so I was blindsided many, I would still be blind, so I would still say that in certain regards, even though I have a more of a discerning spirit, uh, that uh, we talked about that old girlfriend. I never kissed her. Uh, I dated her in high school. I didn't have my first kiss until uh, late in my freshman year of college. Was mm -hmm. so I was I was really pretty naive mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a lot of ways. But I also went to college at sixteen. So okay. so I wasn't prepared for any. I, I saw things going on around me, but I didn't know anything about them, and nobody had ever spoken to me. Uh, I had a European father that was, uh, we, we, we didn't talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a, an era in the 50s of being yeah. a, a post-Holocaust generation, and you just didn't, you didn't have sure. a, you weren't buddies. It, yeah. it, it was a different kind of parental uh, situation. So in your book, Anatomy of an Affair, you uh, cover um, risk history and uh, you have uh, uh, characteristics, uh, a danger partner profile. You have uh, so many resources, how to figure out the risk factors. Is this a study in uh, what not to do, or, or could this actually be abused? Uh, you know, I, I, I see these instructions and all these news about bomb, about bomb makers and all these things and so much information on the Internet. Uh, I remember as a kid, my father taking me to a neighborhood, showing me where bad people hang out. Mm. Uh, and I was a child of the 60s, and at that age, I didn't know where to go to get 
if I wanted marijuana. I didn't know where to go to get marijuana, but my father had actually taken me to the neighborhood to show me that if I didn't walk the straight and narrow and turn my life around, I was going to wind up like one of these guys. Mm. Well, it turned out that he inadvertently was the one who showed me where to go to get marijuana. Mm. So yeah. I, I want to be sure that our audience understands that you don't come out of this with the handbook of how. <laughs> well, I certainly hope not. That's not my goal. But my goal was to figure out, and I began to really believe in the fact that there are risk factors. Your personal story, your family of origin practices, your personal life practices. I think there's specific seasons of life. 50% of all first-time affairs that, that happened in America happened during pregnancy and the first year after delivery. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that. As you begin to think about it, it makes practical sense. Right. So on this research team that I joined from 88 to 98, we took research that had some had already been done, and we added some others. 4,000 pastors we surveyed. We're looking for risk factors. We're looking for frequency. We're looking for statistical significance. So this doesn't just fall out of the sky. It's not a curse. If you have some of those risk factors, you need to pay close attention to that. And I tell you, I think Lucifer in Luke 4, uh, Luke, uh, the gospel writer, has some interesting things to say. He's tempted Jesus, and then he leaves him, and here's what he says, uh, the gospel writer says, the devil left him for a more opportune time. So there are seasons in your life when you're more vulnerable than another season. There's some great research out, uh, Pastor, on what we call misattribution of attraction started in the 70s and basically would you like to hear this yes uh, please. How, this, okay so this researcher built two foot bridges that went up high up towards the ceiling of this research lab they were identical and he put a visual barrier between them but the one difference was the one bridge was very secure bolted down great guy wires the other was very loose shaky etc he marches 20 college guys across the bridge one at a time, the sturdy bridge. He puts a average looking college female at the end of the bridge. He develops an evaluation form, kind of a Likert type scale, one to five, and they rate how attractive she is. He brings the same 20 guys back. He puts the college, same college co-ed at the end of the bridge. They walk across one at a time. They give them the same review of this, the attractiveness. She is always, always, statistically significantly more attractive to those guys when they've walked across the shaky bridge. Now, what that basically means, and his conclusion is, when you go through stressful experiences in life and you see a woman at the end of the bridge, she is going to be more appealing and attractive to you than she really is in real life. That's called misattribution of attraction. You can Google it. It's, it's, it's fascinating because I can actually think in my mind of people that I've worked with that when they were on the shaky bridge yeah. was began almost like the law of drift. You could watch yeah. the, you could watch them drift. Oh, we're, yeah. we're talking with Dave Carter, author of Anatomy of an Affair, uh, an incredible study material that I would recommend that every board member of a church, every deacon be required reading. Uh, I, have, I, have, I had one book, The Bait of Satan, that I required all my elders and deacons and leadership to read. Uh, I would add this to that exact same list of books, uh, Anatomy and Affair. How Affairs, Attraction, and Addictions Develop, and How to Guard Your Marriage Against Them. I think that every man and woman needs to examine this because we're experiencing in believers' homes the same rate of divorce and the same rate of second marriage failure and the same rate of third marriage failure, and it should not be so. So when we come back, we're going to talk to Dave a little bit more about the anatomy of an affair and what we can do, how we can assess, and how we can recover. We'll be right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and 
host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Well, Shalom, there's a lot of stories. Shalom, and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking to Dave Gar Carter, author of Anatomy of an Affair, How Affairs, Attractions, and Addictions Develop, and How to Guard Your Marriage Against Them. Dave, welcome back to the program. 
Well, thanks. Look forward to finishing this off well. Yes, Dave, you um, uh, have um, charts, full-size charts for Anatomy of Affair that are available, and I'm fascinated by them. Um, you have a marital satisfaction timeline, primary risk factors, uh, your primary risk history. Um, I managed a large organization for both H HP and AT&T, and I can think back to traveling with female employees. And when I went to HP, I wasn't a believer before, <clears throat> and then when I went, went to HP, I would say, listen, I can't stay in the same hotel as my female employees. And they would say, well, that's not in our policy. That's too much work for a travel department. And I said, I, I don't care. I will not stay in the same hotel. I do not want the appearance of me coming down an elevator and the door opening and that female employee standing next to me and assume, people assuming that we were sleeping together. So I'm just going to avoid, you know, I was probably meticulously legalistic and religious about it, but I said to them, and, and it, it became troublesome because I demanded, I just said, if I have to pay for it, uh, myself, I'll pay for it, but I'm not going to be put in that position. But I don't think that people think like that. No, they don't. Now, Billy Graham did, though. We, that was, came up recently, and I thought that was very interesting that they, the news commented on that kind of practice of his. Yes. You know, whenever you travel uh, like that with a colleague from a business, it has all the components of a date. You eat very expensive meals. You go to entertainment venues. You can drink all the alcohol you want. They'll reimburse you for all your expenses. And then you go back to the same hotel. That, that's, that's a date. It has all the components of a date. <laughs> so it's no wonder people get in trouble all the time. You know, it's interesting. Our prior guest was June Hunt, and we were talking about the casting couch, and the term came into vogue uh, in 1937 when it was, wow. first, it was first introduced into society. And you and I both know what casting couch means. Uh, everybody knows it's been around 81, year, uh, 81 years, 81 years in our vocabulary, and everybody knows it, and nobody's outraged by it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we see that there's two approaches within the church to a fallen congregant or fallen minister. And one approach, which seems to be the predominant approach, is for the army of Christ to shoot their wounded. They can do that pretty easily sometimes. Just uh, cut them off and uh, let them just kind of bleed to death. So, yeah. But now we really are trying to develop some ways to minister to them and to help them heal. And we've actually getting some research that would suggest uh, that we're being pretty effective in, in, in a number of cases. There's, there's a particular mega church organization that subscribes to the philosophy that if one of their pastors falls, they relocate the pastor to a different church within the organization and put him in a rehabilitation program of counseling and oversight and retooling. Uh, they do their best to keep the marriage together if they possibly can, offering support for both the husband and the wife, but they do remove them from the pulpit and put them in an under-shepherd uh, kind of capacity. And then eventually, after about nine months, they begin to surface again within their new environment. And then maybe within a year, year and a half, year and a quarter, uh, they're assigned a new church and they're restored, uh -huh. uh, which I think is, is um, you know, if you were an alcoholic and you got sober, should you not be given a second chance? If you're a drug addict and you got clean, should you not be given a second chance? If you went through a marital infidelity and got uh, help, and we're able to save the marriage. Now, what is your position from the standpoint of uh, a pastor who has fallen and the marriage is irretrievably broken? Should that pastor be able to be reinstated? 
Well, if you're talking about him uh, being reinstated to a, a pulpit type ministry, yes. a preaching ministry, I personally don't uh, really see that in the future. I feel like there, there's, in this culture especially, we have to hold a high ideal. He might recover. He might save that marriage. I love that idea. I think he can have all kinds of other ministry in a local congregation. But that pulpit ministry, to me, uh, needs to be elevated to a very special, unique status. Now, that can also encourage lots of pastors to hide sin <laughs> because they know uh, this is one of the few occupations in the world where you're going to, if you are found out to have violated this code, you, you might never be able to practice your skill set again, or you, you've got thousands of dollars invested in your education, you're just going to throw it out the window. So they hide things. Lots of pastors are not forthright. And so one of the things I love for pastors to be involved in is not accountability groups. I don't like that term. I like vulnerability groups. I like the idea where everybody in the group is equally vulnerable. We don't need more dads or mothers in our lives. We had two of those. So <laughs> I need you That's to true. be forthright and straightforward with a group of guys that you can trust as you kind of walk through life together. I think it's very important. Uh your book is focused on um, uh, adultery, adultery recovery, how to understand the risk factors, both for clergy and for non-clergy. Right, uh, right. How are churches receiving this? Because the, you know, the Harvey Weinstein, the the. The, the casting couch, the people who are coming out now and accusing people of long years and years and years, 20, 30, 40 years ago of behavior. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting because as believers, I came to faith 22 years ago. I, I had already lived 44 years as a devout uh, uh, secular Jew who um, if, if subscribed to Aristotle, if it felt good, do it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I know that there's in my past, and we all have them, when I came to faith, and that past was forgiven, it didn't remove the history. As a matter of fact, you're overcomers by the word of your testimony, meaning you're going to have to recount some history. That's what a testimony is. It yeah. is your life before Christ. Yeah. So you have to, you're going to have to sift through a lot of the filth to find the nuggets that are tellable mm -hmm. uh, that can show yeah. how this journey is. Uh, yeah. So what is it that um, uh, churches and, and clergy and families will gain uh, through this in both the pre-affair uh, state in, in eliminating, you know, let's say a wife gets a hold of this book and she recognizes that her husband uh, pays more attention to her best friend. Does she call him out on it? How oh, well, in the back of the book, I have a contract that I think every husband and wife really ought to sign that they're not going to knowingly cultivate a relationship with a member of the opposite sex. Okay. Now, uh, people do, though. Remember, you, you, we just cannot dismiss that affairs or adulteries all begin with emotion, powerful, lustful feelings, attractions. This doesn't, you're not thinking logically when you do this. Right. You're emotionally elevated when you do this. So the point is, uh, you know when this is happening. You know when this is going on. And you need to be forthright about that. I think uh, one of the things we talk about in the recovery process, to the degree that the spouse can forgive the other spouse, to that degree they can start rebuilding respect. And to the degree they start rebuilding respect, they can start rebuilding trust. And to the degree they rebuild trust, they can rebuild love. So it goes forgiveness respect, trust, and love. And if you don't have the respect and trust, I don't, you don't have a marriage. Marriages are built on respect and trust. 
And so when there aren't, when I did, I did this teaching over in um, Hong Kong here a few years ago, and the thing that was going on at that time is the wives were jumping out of high rises with their babies when they were finding out that their husbands had other families over on the mainland. Women don't share husbands very easily. And they shouldn't, okay? It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a commitment. So the respect and the trust has to be there for couples to really make it a go of it in this culture. Otherwise, you're just living a lie. And you're teaching your kids how to have a really crappy marriage. Dave, you've, you've just confirmed for our audience a message that I give on a cord of three strands is not easily broken. That's right. Uh, we yep. spend all our time talking about the three strands and we never talk about the cord. And I'll tell you, if you have a cord that's 50 years old and you've left it sitting out on the dock tying your boat to the dock and you haven't checked it and read wound it and lubricated it and, and made sure that it wasn't unraveling, that those three strands haven't changed. They're still you. They're still the Lord. They're still your spouse. But if you don't do any cord maintenance, right, That's right. when that cord becomes tested, the cord's going to break because yeah. it's weathered and worn. Yeah. And we spend more time talking about the strands than we do about the cord. Yeah. And we're misfocused uh, because we need to talk about cord maintenance. How do you right. maintain the cord? Uh, because God doesn't change and the individuals are still the people. The, there are the other two strands. So our focus needs to be on that cord. And are you putting yourself in a position? Are you open to hearing a dialogue where someone says to you, you know, you, you keep talking to that person uh, I'm starting to get a little concerned for you. And that's where you're talking about vulnerability that's right. groups. Um, yeah. You need to be able to share this because in this culture, men and women do more together than they've ever done. They work out together. They they uh, participate in clubs together. They, they work at the job together. You, your wife might not be interested in your career track. She might not like engineering, but you got a gal at work who does. And uh, they might sing on some kind of a worship team somewhere. They share music together. I don't sing. My wife does. So you just have to be constantly alert in this culture. Right? It happens kind of like the frog in the kettle. Nobody goes out and looks for a sexual partner other than their spouse. Not in Christendom normally. Okay, But over time, it's the frog in the kettle. The heat builds up. You don't want to acknowledge it. Pretty soon you're in a fatal situation and you get bushwhacked or blindsided. You get engulfed in these feelings. And it is so hard at that point to escape and get out of it. Dave, the workshops that you're doing now with churches, uh, you are uh, at Dave Carter, C-A-R-D-E-R dot -E com. And you actually have... Uh, a program that you conduct at churches for clergy and for leadership uh, right. as well as a message for the general congregation so you also right. speak uh, to to the congregation about this issue that uh, at one point in time I think it was just an acceptable taboo uh, almost uh, a certain awareness that when my husband travels you know, he's probably unfaithful, but I don't know for sure. I don't know anything about it. So it just is, a, it's just a seed that's going to sit in the back and, and uh, it may never come out because that they make their living. I used to be in the staffing business and we had two kinds of people. We had people who, if their husband didn't travel, they would get a divorce. And we had other people that if their husband did travel, they would get a divorce. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we kind of looked at it as those two categories and we would have to assess, are you in a marriage where your wife wants you to be a road warrior? She doesn't want you around the house Monday through Friday. Or is she one that wants her husband home every night knowing where he is? Uh, which one are you? And that way we'll know which client we should be talking with you about because of that, of that scenario. Uh, why is it that 
the amount of pastors who are falling seems to be, well, let me rephrase. Is it that it seems to be on the increase or we're just becoming more aware? It's just becoming more visible. In the survey of 4,000 pastors we did from 88 to 98, 21% of the pastors admitted that they've been sexually indiscreet. The final question on the survey was, did you tell the truth on this survey? An additional 14% said, no, they did not tell the truth. They admitted they lied. So we're now up in the mid thirties, somewhere around percentage wise. We're not a three. Of those pastors who acknowledge 21% of those pastors, I think there's something like 800 and 900 of them, seven, only 7% seven of that number admitted their churches ever found out about this. Only 7%. So this is much more frequent than we have a tendency to know about and to find out about. And people hide this kind of behavior. As a result, uh, we, we're not even beginning to kind of treat it. We're not beginning uh, to get involved in those kind of processes, except in extreme cases. But I do think there's a growing interest, especially with all the pornography that's on people's phones, the easy, ready access. Maybe you saw the Time magazine cover last year where the five newly married guys could not be sexual with their spouses because they had such a pornographic history and they were desensitized. They just could not be erotic with their brand new wives. So it's a big issue and it's a growing issue. And I think there's growing awareness. You know. Pastors aren't the only ones that kind of act out. If you do this in the military, you lose. You're kicked out. You're discharged, okay? So I've done training for uh, uh, chaplains and training for family life educators, stuff like that, Navy social workers. It's a big issue. Dave, are any of the seminaries adopting any part of this into the curriculum uh, into making potential pastors uh, especially youth, because we've had yeah. this this extensive exposure to youth through gymnastics, through the Boy Scouts, through uh, so many uh, Penn State uh, issue with uh, Sandusky, so many uh, youth areas as being one particularly difficult category. I've never seen such an incidence or news reporting on teachers having sex with their students, mm -hmm. uh, this has just been a new phenomenon that, that uh, is, is uh, overwhelmingly disturbing. But are the seminaries teaching this from an ethics and from a early onset of how to avoid and how to be aware and what measures you need to take and uh, the husband goes to the seminary, but the wife doesn't. Yeah. Are, yeah. There, are there inclusionary programs? Uh, well, there's certainly a growing interest. I personally have taught in four or five different seminaries. I know the book is required reading in some seminary classes. I actually go to Talbot Seminary here in the month of May and teach in the D-Men program. Uh, on this same subject matter. And I've done all kinds of leadership things for mission agencies and um, parachurch groups, et cetera, who are expressing a concern because it's very costly to a church or a denomination to recover from something like this, especially with the sexual harassment and the uh, sexual clergy uh, misconduct. Uh, states are beginning to legislate this and it's now becoming a criminal offense and not just a civil offense. So you will be arrested in uh, a number of states already if you act out like this, just like a psychologist would uh, for violating uh, the ethics code for their license. So there is a growing interest in building protections around parishioners uh, just to make sure that this kind of stuff doesn't happen. So you're seeing that people are starting to become aware and... Yeah. Uh, um, so in the last, we've got uh, two minutes left in this segment. Uh, what is your message for somebody who's struggling and they're either exhibiting 
some of these danger factors that we've identified, which is uh, that touch on the shoulder or too much time or, or it's moved from business conversation to personal conversation. What help and resources are there out for them and what's your message for them? I would say this, two things that you can do, okay? First of all, you like the person that you marry. Most of us marry somebody we like. I, I've never met anybody who hasn't, but there might be somebody out there. So you need to get back to what you do best. You need to identify what you have dropped along the way that used to be a part of your daily lives. And there's a very simple exercise you can do. The husband and the wife both make a list of the eight greatest highlights of their dating and their married life. No kids can be involved, no other couples, no births of babies, no wedding ceremony, just the two of you. Most happily married couples will identify three to five that match. And you fill in the balance, you merge the two lists, and those are the eight best things you do. And I would encourage you to spend money on your marriage and reinstate those kinds of practices. We'll buy refrigerators, we'll buy anything, we'll buy cars, but we don't spend money on our marriage. And as a result, marriage has a tendency to atrophy and to die and to just not provide the kind of nurturance we both need long-term in the relationship. So we think we'll get a new partner, that'll help us. It, it doesn't, it just compounds the problem. So a, a th second thing I would say, you need to compliment each other. Don't take each other for granted. You know, it's we b all need more admiration and affirmation and we need accommodation where you kind of help your schedule and, and adjust and fit me in so I'm important to you. So those are the two things I would say can be really helpful to couples. Well, thank you for that, Dave. I strongly recommend this book, Anatomy of an Affair, Dave Carter. If you're in any kind of organization, doesn't have to be ministry related, any business, anywhere where there are a group of men and women interacting, and you're looking to be an agent of marital preservation, you know, divorce doesn't just impact the church or the congregation. It impacts uh -huh. the company. It impacts the family. It impacts the friends. When we look at the marriage definition for the two, for a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they will become one. When that one is split, it is like splitting the atom. There is nuclear fallout and this can be avoided. And this book is a guidebook to help you assess the risks involved in your life, things you might be doing, you think are harmless that really may be very quite harmful. And it is a compounding effect that you need to understand. That's why it's called the anatomy of an affair because there's different parts to it that wind up culminating in an actual affair. So I strongly encourage you. Thank you, Dave Carter, for bringing, bringing this to us here on Revealing the Truth. It was a pleasure talking with you about this book, a great resource. And you can find him at DaveCarter.com. Thanks. Appreciate it. God bless you. All right. And that concludes our live broadcast day, but stay tuned to our YouTube channel. Uh, also, this Facebook feed will continue running all throughout the day as all of our guests get repeated all throughout the day until we come back in the studio tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock a.m. Central Time for the next edition of Revealing the Bible followed by three episodes of Revealing the Truth. Until we see you back here in the studio tomorrow at 9 a.m., we bid you shalom.